back in the mid 90s, we started a conversation from the rooftop of a seminary. We are studying philosophy, and theology, and scripture. I wanted to know how this affected real life. This wasn't just academic. Be able to explore the depths of things. We began to look at the world and say, what does all this mean? What do we make of it? See if they want to come and spend a few moments with us and join our conversation. Good morning, Father Winslow. And good morning to you. Happy Easter. Eh, yes, indeed it is. We are on the other side of that darkness, having gone through now the triduum that we spoke about last time. And I was considering maybe doing the foil to that particular episode in which we could perhaps talk a little bit, tease out a little bit, what it means to set your sights on the higher things, as mm. it were. Since now well, I just want to go on record. Season. I wasn't too much in the dark during Lent. I live in the light of Tabor. Uh, that's just, <laughs> just for people who don't understand what that means. Uh, so before, You should explain the story. Yeah, so before our Lord approaches Jerusalem to be turned over, betrayed, crucified, he takes a few of the apostles and they go up at Mount Tabor, and he's transfigured. So you'll know this if you pray the luminous mysteries of the rosary. The transfiguration is considered to be the quintessential luminous mystery it's where his illumination occurs i think as you say saint thomas talks about this as the cessation of a miracle where the miracle really is that we can't see him in his true nature as god but uh, he drops that miraculous um disguise well the overflow say, of grace or the overflow of grace into his humanity yeah okay so he allows us to see it or allows them to see it and so they get uh, a, a taste of his glory before in anticipation of. Um, so your exegesis on this passage. So is that, <laughs> is that you always have to have a little taste of that glory, a little taste of that victory, a little taste of the benefits of the, res of the resurrection as you go into Holy Week. Notice how many times he used the word taste. Yes, I, think I did. Re referring I particularly did. To, to so the light of Tabor is always <laughs> with me, even during the dark moments of Lent. So that said, for those of us who actually need penance, because Father Winslow doesn't I do need penance, but I rely um, on yours. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> but in any event, so no, that's a, that was a, it's a running joke. So we need to fill you in in case I ever reference the light, the of, light Tabor of Tabor again. Tabor which I likely will because I've been referencing it for this years. This is true. All our, right, so now let's our, go back. Well, our spiritual director in the house, uh -huh. um, Father Matthew Bittner, um, ramps up the penances for the men at the seminary. And we begin, oh, I don't know, somewhere around uh, September. Uh, <laughs> With a long of, list. And they sort of ramp up to the point at which we arrive close to the triduum and it takes two pages to print them out all the different penances yeah, that no, are suggested there's no, there's no light of Tabor peeking through that dark <laughs> veil I can promise you so this the priests don't come to the seminary during the, the latter part of Lent <laughs> they, no, they that's avoid sad. it that's sad I don't want to go, I don't want to be projecting a, you know a perfectly lax image of discipline that's not true uh, I, I just I just think that we always have to have the Christian light Mm. Uh, even in their penances. So um, I, I might lean into that a little too much on the laxity side, but uh, uh, I, I think I'd rather go that direction than the austere. Well, I think everyone would rather go that direction. <laughs> <laughs> all, right, all, right, all right, back to your foil concept. All right, all right. What's the so foil? We have, to, we have to speak about the fact that now that we're on the other side, right? St. Paul, our, our Lord, the letters of St. Peter enjoin us to think about high things. And I think one of the difficulties that I've found in both Lent and Easter, as well as teaching Dante, is it, and I, I bring this up because it, it, it just happened recently again, that people find themselves rather at home in the inferno, which is sort of telling, I suppose. Oh, that so we, not everyone has read Dante. Uh, so Dante is the, the Divine Comedy, and um, uh, uh, fifteenth century, uh, or I'm sorry, fourteenth century Italian poet, the greatest poem that's ever been written. Um, it's a huge epic uh, drama of a man who goes through hell, uh, with accompanied by his 
his sort of poetic mentor, Virgil, and to get to heaven, he gets to catalog what he sees, and so he goes through hell. On the other side of hell is, is the mountain of purgatory, and he goes, climbs that mountain, and then he goes up into the Empyrean, up into heaven, and then finally beholds the face of God. It's an incredible poem, very difficult to, to interpret sometimes because of all its particular uh, references to historical figures that he knew, etc., and all of its, its allusions to Greek and Roman history, but nevertheless, it's worth every bit of, of effort. But for the purposes of wait, wait, wait. our discussion... Once again, you're welcome... <laughs> I'm here to make. I Father think Cal you underestimate. I think they all know what Dante's divine comedy is. Yeah, they all sit around it reading epic Italian poems. <laughs> well, I mean, anyway. Yes, yes, yes. So the the thing is, is that when we go through the inferno, everyone gets sort of intrigued because it's talking about these what Dante calls the contrapasso, this this opposite sort of um, the, the the counter step, right? The opposite sort of um, penance or, or, or uh, punishment in hell based upon the sin that you had. It's really it's like interesting to watch how to they whatever were so... whatever your vice is. Right, because we, we create our own hells, mm -hmm. and so you get what you love in some sense. And then you get to purgatory, and people are still sort of intrigued because it's still talking about reformation of, of self and attachment to sin and the And then also has to be tailored. To, also very to deal tailored. with whatever it is that you need to be purified of. Oh, but then you get to heaven, and it's like people lose interest. Um, I mean, the, the reader. The reader. I was going to say, the people in heaven don't lose interest. In <laughs> not in God. No. Um, and that's not universally the case, but it's often the case. And what I wanted to just bring up is that I think it's much more difficult for us to live Easter than it is for us to live Lent. Mm. Um, so I'm asking you that question since you are the... Doctor of Tabor. Tabor. Um, how it is that one properly lives Easter without it just becoming no, okay? True. I gave up this, 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 no, and now I, I, I go back to it. It can become the a and celebration just, of gluttony. Right? Yeah, I mean, sure. it can't. It, it can't be that. And also, if you happen to introduce good habits as part of your Lenten discipline, it doesn't mean that you stop doing them into Easter. The mm. idea is to carry them through to cultivate this this goodness um and I, w I would just recommend for those people out there thinking about next lent if you want to introduce a good habit i would say introduce it at least 50 percent over of what you want it to be on the other side hmm. so that you give it like a really hard push and then you you would miss it on the other side and y going down to a hundred percent of what you want it feels like a relaxation, but at the same time, it give you have the proper muscle to carry out that good habit. Does that sound like a good advice? Absolutely. So, okay, so let's get back into the, the, the this the celebration of Easter. Um, I, I I would say first and foremost, for me, I find myself just filled with a certain amount of joy. Um, it's a fruit, mm -hmm. and I think that. Uh, as you've heard me say uh, in times past, that fruits can't be acquired directly. So if I said to you, you know, Father Cal, would you please go make me an orange? You couldn't go into the kitchen and, you know, whip out ingredients and make me an orange. Mm -hmm. That's not possible. To make me an orange, you have to actually grow a tree and you have to cultivate a tree and then the tree would produce a fruit. And that fruit would be this indirect res this result, but an indirect one of your work would grow. Uh, and I think of that in terms of the joy that at least that I experience uh, in this Easter time, and I know that you experience, and we would hope that everyone else experiences, it has to be the fruit of something else. And so uh, it's the time to, to, to grab a hold of that fruit and to really enjoy it, to, to revel in it, to, to pluck it, if you will. Uh, but this is where you get into the logic of preparing for Easter. Right, exactly. Because it's the work of the cultivation. It's the labor of, on the tree. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. And I think that <clears throat> most people probably have an experience of going, for example, if we're going to set our sights on the higher things, particularly during Easter, I think most people have an experience of attempting to go spend some extra time in the church, to, to spend some extra time in prayer, etc. And the time spent might be fairly distracted and um, 
a bit disorganized at times. And nevertheless, they, they have the experience of having left there and something's different, or even maybe the next day that something has happened, but they don't always connect that with the labor that they went through mm-hmm. to get there, to commit the time, to have the discipline, to go pray, and then the actual fruit that results from that, which is a, a greater intimacy with God and, and the fact that grace resides differently in your soul. Um, and I, I mean, th- the resurrection is a fruit of, of the cross of Christ, and they're two sides of the same coin. Well, it, it's, 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 a, it's a rather... Uh, it's a rather uh, felicitous sort of analogy, right? Because you're, you're talking about when, when, when Christ says that, when it says about Christ that he, for the sake of the joy that laid before him, he endured the cross. Not because he desired the cross per se, but the joy that was before him. And then to, to use your analogy, plants himself, right, in the, in the tomb. Yeah. And then in that um, allusion to Genesis, let the land bring forth life. Um, and he does. He brings forth the life um, of himself that he had planted in there and all that labor now is is coming out and so all the different scenes which i find fascinating the church gives us these these little vignettes of our lord appearing afterwards and and you you have exactly what you're describing they're all exceptionally joyful because someone that they loved most was dead and he's alive it's that simple you know i was thinking about this uh with the the reading this week of the gospel where our Lord says to Mary Magdalene, um, you know, don't, don't touch me or, or, or don't hold on to me. Right, right. Um, I have not yet ascended to my father. And I was thinking about the scene in natural terms. And I thought to myself, she must have just grabbed a hold of yes, him. Yes, I was thinking the same thing. I actually like preached on this on Easter morning. Right? Yeah. And at some point he just had to say, uh, you have to let, you me, have to let go. me go. You have I, to let me go. Things need to be done. Yeah. But and on her side, I can relate to it. He, she didn't want to. Yeah. Don't leave me again. Right. Um, and uh, she just wanted to cling to him. And I, you know, I could actually just picture, yes. you know, if your mother thought you were right. dead, right? right? She right. sees you. Right. She just holds on to you. Uh, and, and she wouldn't want to let go. Yes. Um, and so it, 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 sometimes when we read that part, it sounds a little cold right. coming from our Lord. But when you think about what that experience was like in human terms it's not cold it's actually okay we've had a long enough embrace how you know how many more minutes can we go here right i mean it's, <laughs> we got to get on i've got to take care we of this we have some things to do still. we, we gotta I open gotta, the I doors of heaven to, here i haven't even talked to my disciples yet. i haven't <laughs> talked to them yet i gotta show them i gotta create a path that has yet to exist yeah. into uh, you know the kingdom of god it's a good thing i went to my mother before i came to see you <laughs> exactly that, that's another tradition right <laughs> You know, it's it's true. I was mentioning to the faithful I had mass at St. Mark's and uh, and Easter, and I just said that the text doesn't give us the in between. All it does is say when Our Lady or when uh, Mary Magdalene says Rabboni, and the next line is you know don't cling to me. But um, we don't know how long that was. Did he laugh? Did he smile? Did he did he embrace her? Did 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 she just did she embrace him on his feet so he couldn't get away? Did she hug him? What what did she do? We we don't know. And so that filling in that little gap there um, of joy and the fact that he was a gardener, right? She thought him, he was a gardener yeah. because, of course, this is fitting into our, our theme of cultivation, um, that he's, he's, he's cultivated the work. Right. Um, and there's the fruit. And that's what I, I want to kind of just impress upon our listeners is that to take these 50 days that the church gives to us um, and and enjoy the fruits of the labor of Lent. Concentrate on the things that are high. Put away the things of, of earth. So it's just the opposite of now falling into this sort of, um, uh, for lack of a better term, as you, you, you mentioned, gluttony. And this is sort of... As it weighs you down. The, the, the Literally you down. and otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> True. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, and that's, I think, the part of it, it is the joy of Easter is interior. There's just no other way to put it. That you you know, celebrate with a great meal or that you have, you know, some good wine and drink with friends. uh, Those are almost, um, in a certain way, their own fruits, uh, in a certain sense, because they're flowing out of uh, an interior joy. Uh, They're ways of incarnationally expressing the joy that we feel interiorly. But if you were to just have that, now, you, you know, I'm saying a lot here, right? Because I love, love, love desserts and candy. I mean, mm. that's my thing. And, you know, I, 
and, and I would love nothing more than, you know, a holiday centered around a basket full of candy <laughs> that you just eat for, you know, 50, 40 days, however you want to call it. But, you know. Was Halloween your favorite feast growing up? Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> the whole idea of people throwing candy at you was a very happy idea. Uh, so, so for me to say that's not the joy of Easter is for me it's to say lot. very clear. That's a lot. Because for me, that's an expression right. of a joy that's right. deeply interior. And if, you know, seriously, you have to work at that, uh, again, all year long, not just in Lent, yeah. but really all year long. You know, so for example, when I'm, you know, reading the Divine Office or, you know, I'm praying now that Easter is upon us, when I do that, I, my joy is interior. You know, I, as I'm sure it is with you, it, it just... It's effervescence. Yes. It's a light. It's a lightsome quality of the soul. It it's is. it's a skip. <coughs> it's a skip of the heart. It's a. It's just different, and uh, it's there that these other things like meals for feasting right. and um, candy. Yeah, you and have to bring your joy feasting. to the feasting, not try to get your joy exactly. From the feasting. That, that's exactly the right way yeah. to put it. And the, and the, you know, Joseph Pieper once said it was a great German. Uh, theologian philosopher Thomas, he once said that the difficult, the, the difficult thing is not throwing a party. It's finding anyone who knows how to celebrate mm. and can celebrate. And I think he's right because if we don't have something that really causes joy inside of us, then the celebration is just ends up being about the food and the drink or the setting or the whatever. And then it always falls flat. Yeah. Um, because you, because you, you can't get joy you, from that. You can't get joy from that. You get certain that. pleasures, but not joy. Yeah. You know, I, as you were saying that, I thought to myself, it's true, because joy also has a way of unlocking our personality and character. It, 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 it allows us, in a certain way, to be like a child. Yes. And I find that adults coming out of teenage years, uh, and then sometimes enduring even until older age, we have a hard time being generous with our personality sometimes. I think that we can be stingy with it. In mm -hmm. fact, I think that sometimes with married couples or people who have been together for a very long time, there can be a stinginess of personality. Mm -hmm. There's a certain amount of reticence to allow people to have access to themselves in that way. Whereas a proper celebration with joy in the soul, it, it releases... In, in a childlike way, the personality and the character, and other people then contagiously experience that joy, and it brings their defenses down. So when you're getting together and you're celebrating and you're feasting, y y y y when you bring that joy to the equation, you become more manifest, your character, your persona, uh, and it's more generously given to others. Yes, I think this gets into one of the, the themes that you speak about a lot with respect to our own fraternal life amongst the brother priests and the seminary and things of that nature is making sure that we have a proper sense of play. You know, there was a line that I read once that contemplare est ludere, which is a that to contemplate is to play on some level. That when you when you behold something that you really love, and it, 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 as it were, um, translates inside of you as a great joy because you possess it, you, you have it inside of you, the, the love that you have and the fruit that comes from that, which is joy. Um, it, it causes you to want to play, as you yeah. said, the, the skip, as it were, of the heart. And so maybe that's another way of suggesting an actual thing to do during this time is to do things that are not productive do things that are not simply for the purpose of getting something else done or advancing a particular ball, but to spend time with those that you actually have been given in your life to love and to enjoy them, to play. And, and generously, like, for example, I think of a perfect example of being stingy with self is in those teenage years. So many of us, I mean, I can think of it myself, where we were like, just kind of caught up in your own internal aspirations and things and you when you were at home to mom and dad or to you know brothers and sisters you might just be just walled off mm -hmm. but because there was a different world you wanted to engage out there and then you would go out there and you might be you know mr care you know charisma but at home you might be locking the door and closing the door right, to kind right, of stingy right, right, right. and it's 
I get it. It's, you know, those teenage years, it's, it's hard. And you don't always realize that the people that you love are in that house. And those are the people yeah. uh, that you want to share yourself with right, more. Right. And some, but some kids do that better through the teenage years than others. But it's not uncommon, you know, that kids just kind of wall themselves off. And then maybe a parent sees them interacting with somebody else. And they're like, why are they so charismatic with their friends? But at home. They're just kind of closed off and, right. you know, almost like a jerk in a way. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's it's a stinginess. And, I, you know, I don't quite understand entirely where it all comes from. I certainly c we could come up with theories. But that joy has a way of being an, an antidote to that. And I think that as adults, we can carry that into our lives, into our relationships and, and different things where, especially relationships that might start to um, uh, um, feel a little weighty or come with obligations and we might start th you know, resenting some of those obligations and then mm. we start being stingy with ourselves because we're, you know, I'm going to do my obligations, but I'm not going to give you the best part of me or right, I'm going to hold right, that right, back. Right. But that joy, that, that Easter joy, allow that just to bring down those walls, to be so generously engaged with others, to be able to, as you say, play yeah. with others. And it's contagious. It's contagious. I, I remember, do you remember that I, maybe a couple of months ago, you and I went and played some Top Golf? I'm not sure if I can yes, mention yeah. a, a company on, on, on the radio, but. Um, well, it's technically not radio, so okay. you're fine. That's true. And we had fun, right? Yeah. Um, and there was a, I'm not sure if you noticed, but there was a, a family next to us in the, in the bay next to us. And it was a mom, dad, and the son and daughter. And clearly the two kids were not into this. Like, mom and dad dragged them out to have right. forced fun, right? Right. And the two of them... They were teeny, teenagers. They were right? teenagers, yeah. And they were on their phones yeah. the entire yeah, time, the sitting time. there on their phones. And dad got up, of course, and, you know, flubbed a thousand shots, and mom, and them. he was trying to get them engaged. And the kids would put down their phone when they were forced to, walk up there, right. huff, shluff, shluffing their, their feet, and huffing and puffing, and hit the ball, and then go back to their phones, and what have you. But I did notice much to my uh, surprise and, and, and happiness, that b at the end, um, the girl had shot this incredibly wild shot and it actually went in and she was so excited about uh, it. And then she got into it. Then the other yeah. boy got into it. Um, and they never hit a good shot again. Yeah. But all of a sudden it broke through that, that barrier and the family, the phones, phones didn't get picked back up. And for a brief moment, yeah. those four people actually had fun. And I, and I bet you, before that moment that if you were to look at maybe if they were texting somebody what they were saying i bet you they were downright charismatic and funny and oh, engaged sure. with whomever they w oh and maybe even saying oh, i'm doing this incredible thing right i'm, right, I'm playing some top right. golf or whatever but they weren't actually <laughs> people's social media lives are very different the joy than their, than their and, <laughs> yeah but you know but joy is contagious yeah and it can do that um, it can do that. But I also think that conscientious, I think all of us need to be generally conscientious of that when, you know, for, for, for all of us to be, um, aware of whatever barriers we might have and maybe be stingy, not to be so stingy with our, yeah. our personality and character. And we have to teach this to our kids, yes, right? Yes, we do. I mean, you know, uh, we got to teach it to our seminarians. We got to teach it to, uh, you know, really to all of us. We don't, want to be so stingy with our own selves. Well, and let's talk about a second, that generosity of, of self relative to the putting on of a genuine party. I mean, it's work. Yeah. I mean, how many times have we said that we sort of make things happen for people and that yeah. they join into? We make worlds we make and all worlds. of a sudden they jump onto those worlds. And one of the things we're trying to train the seminarians into is that y you have to spend time cooking for the people. Yeah. You have to spend time preparing a nice house for the people. Um, because it, it invites them in to, to be a part of something. And you, it, yes, you could just order pizza. Yes, you could just do X, Y, or Z. Um, but it, it's not the same thing well, as you're not receiving actually the labor spreading of spreading the else. joy. Exactly. Right? I mean, at that point, you're just, you're just uh, outsourcing it. Yeah, and, and food becomes fuel. Yeah. And uh, I can just lounge around. And you're looking to get some joy out of a piece of pizza or, wh or right, right. whatever. But it's, that's not where joy comes from. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, obviously it's tasty, but um, <laughs> actually I had some really good pizza the other day. Yeah, yeah, it was fantastic. It was like right, right from Rome, really. Oh, fantastic! Alinos, have you had? See, there's I another no. drop. Oh yeah, they're fantastic. Okay, they should give you a discount. Yeah, oh, let me tell you, if you can go to Alinos, where is it? In, it? There's one in Mooresville. There's one over in Concord. Um, they have a couple. 
but really great business model. They take the high, very high end ingredients for pedestrian food. So uh, yeah, the pizza nice. is, I, I feel like I've already stepped into the whole- Before we go. Before we go. Yeah, well it's true, segment. but I mean, pizza is a very important thing. You know, we bought a, we bought a, uh, one of those unis. Someone gave us an uni for Christmas to try it out to, to make pizza. Pizza, and pizza I oven. It's pizza oven, yeah. Um, but it's quick and it's you know wood fired and it's a lot of fun. We had a bunch of uh, pizzas made the other day, but it's I haven't gotten it down yet. Yeah, got to make the proper proper. What's dough, the temp? What temp does it get to? It can get up to, uh, gosh, I don't remember the the, the, the highest temp, but somewhere around nine hundred degrees. Ooh. Yeah, just with back to little, Dante's Inferno, just with a bit of wood. Yeah, That's right. oh my gosh. No, it's fun. It's fun. So it's not electric. It's no, no, no. You do use wood, and it's got a sort of metal flange. And so what it does is that the, the pizza stone heats up on the bottom, cooks the bottom, and then the flange that goes over the pizza, the fire is sort of directed that way up through a, a pipe. What's a flange? Uh, it's a big piece of metal that goes over the top of the... You're welcome. <laughs> That's not a technical. I'm just okay, helping so, people. So what happens is the flame comes, gets drawn to the mm-hmm. to the um, to the exhaust pipe. So it's a convection the kind of. Yeah. So the, the flame flow. heats and cooks the top of the pizza. The stove. Oh, cooks the bottom. I got gotcha. you. It's a brilliant little design. Gotcha, um, gotcha. But I'm a big fan of pizza. And, but again, that whole point is that we go out there and everyone has to make their own pizza. I kind of know what you're talking about because because uh, the convection can cause you know can pull the flame. Literally, exactly. the fire exactly. over the top. So we it rakes the fire right across the top. So of pizza. we moved into my family mm-hmm. home in the s- late seventies, and that was during the Carter administration, and fuel was going through the roof. And so my dad decided yes, he is that old. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I was I was very young, and so um, my dad decided that uh, a way to save money would be um, to get a wood burning stove. So here we are in a suburban neighborhood. And we have a wood burning stove in the kitchen, and we have massive amounts of wood logs being dropped off on our front lawn. My dad out with a chainsaw, and of course, you know, chopping away. So yeah, we had sort of a country experience in suburbia with a wood burning stove. But if you, you know, how how you light the fire and then the convection is all part of the design of the stove because there is a design to it. And if you if you have the uh, damper open mm-hmm. and then you o- and you and then you open a door uh, uh i'm sorry if, if you have the damper open then you open or the damper closed and you open the door you can you can have some serious problems yeah uh flames are flying everywhere they go everywhere yeah it's, it's you've got to have oxygen. to control the the, the airflow and knowing your dad i'm sure he even threw in the used toothpicks in there are you kidding <laughs> newspapers <laughs> and of course the kitchen felt like Dante's Inferno, which is where the wood burning stove was. Of course, was. And, the, and, the, and the the rest of the house the was freezing, <laughs> chilled. Which is now I have this horrible habit of having to sleep in very cold rooms, uh, otherwise I can't sleep because my dad cultivated this. We thought about bringing your dad on for one of these shows. No, no, I, <laughs> no one should ever give my dad a microphone, ever. Okay, so I have a, I, I have a. All a right, lot. before we go, before another, before we go. So, um, I, I, I just. I want the people at Waze or Google Maps or whoever the people are that help you navigate in mm. your car to give me two extra minutes on the clock. So let me let me just tell you my logic. So I'm driving here. He's always late. No, that's no, the no, point. no. That's not. Well, it's not really that. But <laughs> I I'm driving here, and. I can't, sh- I mean, it is so hard to shave off a minute on Waze. So you're asking them to lie to you. It is, no, well, yes, in a way. I want, <laughs> I want to be rewarded. So, so I want to be able to pull in two minutes under what they, what they suggested that I would arrive at my ETA. And that would make me feel so good. It's a cheap, cheap joy, but I would absolutely love it. Well, remember in the old days, the old, the old Tom Toms, the GPS oh, yeah, and yeah. things, they weren't in real time in the same way. And so you could make tons oh of Oh, my time. gosh. You could feel so good about yes. shaving 10 minutes You off. thought you were Mario Andretti. Exactly. It was fantastic. I mean, now we're not, we're not saying to happen. raise. We're not saying to people in harm's way. I'm just saying I'd like to be able to gain some ground mm. on the road. Can't do it. No. No, because they give you absolute real time. Maybe and in fact, I watch the clock. It'll go up a minute. I'm like, oh. <gasps> You know, like I just because an added accident a happened somewhere, or whatever, yeah. and you didn't do anything wrong, right? Yeah. No, no. I want the old days where they pad it just a little bit, so that I feel good. 
But every single time. Well, speaking about feeling it's good spot before on. we go. Yeah. Um, one thing that I thought I had absolutely no capacity for, and perhaps still don't, is drawing. I've never tried it, mm. and I s sort of got in the mire of this is how I drew when I was five, and I still draw that way. And so the sisters, kindly, uh, to get me out of that, uh, got me a book about drawing, and not just quote unquote how to draw, but how to train your mind um, to drop some of your childhood images, like yeah. a nose is a triangle kind of a thing, sure. and begin to, to draw what you see. Mm. Um, and it was fascinating. So really? they got me a sketchbook. And so um, on Easter Monday, I just sat down and tried it. And it was fascinating. Well, now I have to see it. And I'm, I actually did a pretty decent job. Really? I couldn't believe it. What did it. you draw? It's, well, they have you do a self-portrait. No, right away? Yeah, because it's the face you know the best. And um, I never look at most my likely. Well, I don't either. <laughs> they don't know priests. I mean, <laughs> so I had to take a picture of myself. <laughs> I mean, every time I see myself, I'm like, who is that? Well, that's true because our mental image is different. Than, yeah, I'm than, still uh, 18 in my mental yeah. image. Um, but it was fascinating. And I just want to say it's a great thing to do during Easter season um, mm. because it helps you to see things, to look at things. Differently. Um, so in keeping Better. with our theme, right, to set your eyes on what is, what is above, not on what is earth, to see things as they really are and to enjoy them. That's a great one. But I need a different topic besides my own face. <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> well, I mean, maybe something more inspiring. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> something a little bit less horrifying. <laughs> Back in Lent. <laughs> something a little less, you know, um, earthbound. Earthbound. Something a little more elevated. Amen. Amen. Have a blessed, blessed rest of the uh, octave of Easter. And don't forget, Easter day is eight days and Easter season is 50 so enjoy. Fantastic. God bless you all.